You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Well, we, you, our listeners, are in for a real treat today because we have the amazing author Heather Morris. And in order to talk to her, we are recording in New York State at 9 p.m. at night, and we're meeting with Heather in Australia at 11 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us today, Heather. Oh, you're very welcome. This is a very civilized hour for me. Yes, it is. <laughs> I want to give a little bit of your bio so our listeners get to know who you are as a person. And I loved your bio because it spoke a lot about how and why you became a writer. Heather was told, Heather was born in a small rural town in New Zealand. She was told from a very young age that she could tell a really good story. But growing up in a time when children were asked to be seen and not heard, well, that was enough of that. She grew older and moved to Melbourne, Australia, where she met her husband, Steve. They returned to New Zealand and their family increased to include two sons and a daughter. Heather woke up one morning and realized she was missing something. She went back to her studies and earned a BA in political science, and began social work. After raising her children, she decided to follow her passion for storytelling, and she enrolled in the professional script writing course through the Australian College of Journalism. She went on to attend many screenwriting courses, seminars, and workshops in both Australia and the U.S., and she began to write, and we are all very glad she did. Heather Morris has over 5 million books sold. You will recognize the names of these heartfelt novels, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, Silka's Journey, and the story we're going to talk to her about today, Chris, that Kristen and I adore, Three Sisters. Now, Heather has won so many awards that we would take the entire podcast, but I do want to tell you about a few because they're very well earned and deserved. She is the winner of Audi Award for Fiction, Small Publishers Adult Book Award, Nielsen Gold Bestseller, Apple Book of the Year, Wordery Book of the Year, Easton's Book of the Year, Bertrand's Foreign Fiction Book of the Year, Harper Collins, and many, many more. Her novels have earned their rightful place as number one bestsellers in the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Canada, South Africa, Chile, and several other countries. I also want to uh, make sure we give her the praise that many uh, chronicles in, have given her. The Mail on Sunday says that this book, Three Sisters, is another heart-wrenching, deftly told tale. It's hard not to be moved by such a chronicle. People Magazine calls it a stunning novel. Mystery and Suspense Magazine says Heather Morris proves to be a masterful storyteller as she narrates the story of survival and courage, aided by endurable hope, love, resilience, and a promise that must be kept. Thank you, Heather, for your beautiful writing and this story that cannot help but change lives. Uh, look, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be talking with you today. Heather, we'd like to give our listeners a, a little bit of a background on the story. So if you'll indulge me, I won't give away any spoilers, I promise, but very briefly. Um, for our listeners, Three Sisters is a magnificent, sweeping novel uh, about three young women who are actually real-life sisters. 
who all survived imprisonment by the Nazis at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, the book takes us back to 1942 Slovakia when one of the girls, when she is just 15 years old, is rounded up with other teens for what is described by the Nazis as a work detail. Her older sister voluntarily joins her. The sisters had made their father a promise that they would stick together through life, and her older sister wanted to honor that. A third sister was for a while protected by someone and doesn't join the women at, the, uh, at Auschwitz until later, which is an important part of the story because we see where this uh, survivor's guilt starts to come into play. Um, they experience extreme starvation, overwork, inhumane treatment, and as the Allies are closing in, these young women are on a death march in the middle of winter from Auschwitz. The story continues from there. Uh, and, and to me, this was absolutely riveting, having been to Israel, yeah. and I soak up all manner of books along these lines. The sisters travel to what will be modern-day Israel and their new home, uh, but the freedom there takes on some new dimensions. There's new challenges. The women are struggling with some of the emotional and psychological and even physical effects of the Holocaust and the trauma they experienced. Uh, but we see true peace and happiness throughout the story, just woven throughout. And I am so thankful for this book, and I'm so excited. Are we ready to brave the storm, we Heather sure Chris? Are. We, we adored this book, and we, Kristen, and I believe there cannot be enough stories written about the Holocaust. And we thank you because you have a unique and beautiful, <laughs> heartfelt voice. Our first question um, focuses on the title of the book, Three Sisters. And in your story, you show the reader the absolute gift and blessing and treasure of a family. I have two children, and I've always told them they only have each other in life. Mm -hmm. I made absolute certain they were best friends, and they are. Um, the, three, the father of the three sisters in your book says, and I quote, I want you to make a promise to me and to each other that you will always take care of your sisters that you will always be there for one another no matter what, that you will allow, that you will not allow anything to take you from each other. And it was almost as if the father sensed the trouble looming. I wondered, is this something every parent should say to their children? This promise shared by the sisters saved their lives in the camp. Is this something you personally believe in with your children? Or maybe yeah. something you were showing to sh trying to show the reader? Oh, no, absolutely. Like you, for me, my three children grew up knowing that their sibling love bond connection surpasses any other friendship and relationship they would ever have in their life. They have always known that. And even though they had five years between each one of them, they are still today as adults with their own families as tight uh, as I could have made them. Sibling love, unconditional, forgiving it's, it's a must, I think, for all parents. For me, it was my job, my main job, keep my children bonded. It's a treasure of a theme that you wove throughout this book. And then within your story, you also showed the reader, um, and without giving away any spoilers, the sisters at Auschwitz together in this camp. But it was many times that one of the sisters were able to save the other one's life or prevent yeah. the other one from going into greater harm. And I felt such a strong theme in your book also that one person can make a difference in someone else's life. And I wondered if this was another uh, th uh, theme you were trying to show the reader, that we all could be one helping hand and we all have one voice. Well, absolutely. And that's been the beauty. And I think the challenge for me in writing the story of the girls was to try and get that across even a fraction of what I have seen in my time with Libby and Magda, who I will be back with in only a matter of two weeks, less than two weeks' time. Yeah, absolutely, because they described to me how when one of them or even two of them went down, the other one then stepped up. You know, Livy was the youngest, the baby, and she freely admitted to me that for a large part of her time in Auschwitz-Birkenau, she said, I was a zombie. 
I just put one foot in front of the other. I did what Sibby told me to do. I went where Sibby told me to go. She said, but then Sibby got sick and I had to snap out of it. I now had to look after her. Now, here's something that's not in the book. When the girls finally were reunited in October 44 in Birkenau, the three sisters are together. They were taken on the death march, as you mentioned, in January 45. And at one point in the early days, trying to get from one camp to another in the horrendous snow and storms, they actually said to each other, why don't we just lie down and die together? We're together, we can die now. Because that pact they'd made with their father had been what kept them going, Magda on her own in Slovakia without her sisters. And for Livy, she said, I would have quite happily just lain down in the snow with my sisters and we would have either been shot by one of the passing um, SS or we would have died of the, uh, the conditions. Magda, who had come in late to join her sisters, was the one who said no and started telling the two girls about their home and reminding them of all the beautiful things of their childhood and their growing up and their, their mother and their grandfather. So Magda now came in, having been the one who, yes, has the most survivor guilt because, as she said to me, for two and a half years I slept in my own bed while my sisters were living in this evil, horrific place. That's a lot for a young girl to contend with. It certainly is. And yet look how you you she showed us that with her added strength of having the uh, being able to stay home, to see her sisters in Birkenhau in the death march, to be able to have the strength to tell them, I still remember all the good things that you maybe have forgotten. And I've been home, and, and yes, I have that guilt, but let me remind you of what there is to yeah. live for and the goodness of life that still exists out there apart from us somewhere. What a beautiful testimony that is. What a wonderful story. Yeah. Thank you and that sure. beautiful young girl, she's 98 years of age and um, yeah, still living in her own home in Tel Aviv, looking after herself. How wonderful. And, and can you tell our readers how you met the three sisters very briefly? We'll call it a sliding doors moment in my life. I was in South Africa and I got an email from the son of Livy and he told me how he had picked up a copy of the Tattooist of Auschwitz at Toronto Airport flying to meet his mom in Tel Aviv and spend time with her. The uh, Canadian cover, by the way, is different to the American cover, and that just makes a huge difference. It's just a black cover with two arms coming down and the tattooed numbers on the arms from the elbow. He left that book on his mother's coffee table a couple of days later and wrote to me telling me how she walked past, glanced down at the cover and said to him, that must be about Lali and Geisha. I know them. And when he said to her, how could you possibly know that? She said, look at the number on the arm of the girl. Now look at the number on my arm. They're three apart, aren't they? Auntie Sibby's was two apart. We went to school with Gita. We were on the train going to Auschwitz with Gita. We were on Block 21 with Gita. You've met Gita. She used to come to Israel and stay with your Aunt Magda. You get an email like that, you're responding, trust me. And I did. And I never left South Africa to come home. I left South Africa and flew straight to Israel and into the, the Mala sisters' families. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for writing this beautiful story. It's a story that must be told and we can yeah. never forget. And the, the fact that these women are still alive and able to share this, it's a precious treasure. Thank you. It is. Yeah, um, Heather, you talked a little bit, and I had mentioned earlier about survival's, uh, survivor's guilt, and I was wondering if we could just kind of park there for a second. Um, some people uh, who have experienced a trauma and survived when others didn't, you know, do feel guilty about that, or maybe they feel guilty that they could have done more to prevent the tragedy. Um, this issue surfaces in your novel. You know, for example, we mentioned one of the sisters didn't experience the duration of extreme suffering that the other sisters did, and that became an ongoing issue later. Uh, there were some other characters in your story that felt guilty because they were able to eat when others in the concentration camp weren't, because they were forced to serve the Nazis. And I was wondering, as you have talked with people and heard from people, many survivors, um, how do people process these feelings of guilt 
you know, there's, it seems like your characters chose to embrace life, but it seems yes. like maybe others, you know, punish themselves further. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, absolutely. I have been privileged to meet hundreds of survivors, Holocaust survivors all around the world. And, you know, to a lesser and greater degree, they all had survivor guilt. And they would talk to me about um, what they were struggling with and had been struggling with for decades. But it varied incredibly depending on the individual, what had happened to them after they had survived and whether they'd been able to go home and live in their homeland or they had to move on again. You know, that where the biggest area of survivor guilt was the sister story is, and it's not really told in the book, but I know it because I've heard it from the girls and from their families, is the guilt that their three husbands felt. They had not suffered as much as these girls they subsequently married and had families with. And that was a problem for these men but all of their lives. For two of them, they told their own children very little about their time during the Holocaust. Um, Livy's husband, he was more forthcoming, even though he also had not what he thought suffered. And for the sisters, it's never about suffering. It's not about degree. You don't get to do that. But on the other hand, you can see why they did have that guilt. They all know, they all read, they all know what went on in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And these three men, none of them were there. Well, one of them was there for a period, but he was a, a chef and he was cooking for the, the Nazis and so subsequently getting plenty of food himself. Yeah, maybe maybe that relates to, you know, wanting to empathize with people and take on some of the suffering that they experienced uh, for them because you love them so much. I mean, there's just so many factors that go into this idea of survivor's guilt, but I know that we see it in many contexts, even a car accident or a marriage relationship or, you know, one spouse dies and the other one survives. They almost don't feel like they can enjoy themselves going forward. What a powerful human emotion. And, and I wonder if it's rooted in that empathy and that sense. Look, of it is. But here's the thing about um, hearing these stories and, and trying to help somebody who has got in their case, decades of guilt that they've been carrying. I used to see every day where I worked in a hospital in Melbourne for 20 years, the tragedy and trauma of somebody in front of me for whom that was immediate. It was acute. It was happening right now. And it's actually quite different. So I have got the experience of the acute trauma versus the historical carried for a long time. To be able to tell these stories, and for anyone listening to this, if you are talking to somebody who does have a traumatic or tragic past, here's the thing you've got to remember. You do not get to own any part of their trauma and pain and guilt. It's not yours. Absolutely, you can help them and you can empathise with them, but you can't take it on board otherwise, and it will transfer if you let it. You've got to be acutely aware of that and not let that happen. How else can you help somebody if you take on board it and then you get um, burdened down with that? So just you know, that's the thing to remember when talking to anybody, and I'm not talking about Holocaust survivors, but anyone you're wanting to help. Don't think you can own it. You can just help them by listening. And sometimes it's very difficult to do, isn't it? Because we, even through your beautiful book, we... Um, we weren't just told about the pain, we really related to these sisters in such an intimate way that we felt the pain. Mm -hmm. And I cried through this. I don't think you could read this book without crying. And uh, it helped me to understand something I would wasn't fully capable of understanding until I really heard their full story. And that, that's so true. Thank you for sharing that. Look, it's one thing that I'm, I'm, I've started saying to people who are considering reading the story, by the way, I don't think my publishers like it, but I say it all the same. And that is before you start reading the book, go to the very back of it. You know, don't you dare read that last page, but go and have a look at the photos. You get a picture in your mind of these, these beautiful, ordinary women who survived an extraordinary period of history as a little girl, as teenagers, as brides as mothers, as elderly women, have a look at the photos, then go and read it. I love that because I love any kind of a story about World War II and Holocaust. 
mainly because it did not happen really that long ago. We're not talking yeah. about medieval atrocities here. We're talking about people who lived lives very similar to the comfortable lives we're living today. As you said, birthdays and weddings and special family dinners and trips to the store and that their lives could be so suddenly uprooted and turned upside down and compared to this could happen to us today is shocking. It's yeah. just shocking. And it's a story that we need to learn to ensure that we don't allow it, whatever's in our power. My goodness, couldn't we go on right now about those lessons? Um, but uh, we, we deviate from what we're here for. Yes, yeah, so true, so true. Um, the other question I had for you is uh, just what I just touched upon there, that you showed us uh, that these stories must be repeated, but you showed us something more, and I wanna thank you for this. I never fully understood that the Jews who returned from prison camps after the war and returned throughout Europe were still mistreated. They, they were still yeah. were, was held prejudiced and cruelty against them. The sisters in your book finally migrated to Israel to find peace and belonging. Thank you for showing the reader this truth. It was shocking to me that having known and heard the stories of the horrific, uh, uh, cruelty that these people endured you would think they would have returned to europe with open arms and yeah. loving and it wasn't that why do you <laughs> think that was do do they did they share why they believed this was uh, a continuation the war would not end it seemed in the hearts of people yeah. Well, look, Lali and Geisha fled too. And many, many people who I know here in Australia have survived, that they had to flee. And so Australia had one of the biggest intakes of Holocaust survivors outside of Israel. So why it was in terms of countries like Slovakia and the Czech Republic was Czechoslovakia at the time, those countries then came under communist rule. So for many of them, they were already second-class citizens by not being part of the, the Soviet Union, or they're now part of it, but they still existed and sadly still exists today, a level of anti-Semitism in these countries. Uh, yeah, for them, you know, there was, and I say it in the book, the straw that broke the camel's back for Libby was being abused when she simply wanted to buy a block of chocolate. Yeah. <sighs> especially yeah. after everything she endured and finally yeah. she has freedom and she's back in supposedly the civilized society and that that just horrific it's evil it's just pure evil i i don't have any other way to explain it i mean their homes were taken from they couldn't even go back to their own home so they lost their homes they lost everything and uh, we're not being recognized at all they didn't want special treatment not at all. They just wanted to be a Slovakian. And that's what Lali used to say to me all the time. I considered myself Slovakian, Jewish second. Wow. But that didn't matter. You know, that scene that you referenced about them not being able to go back to their home and being tossed out, um, yeah. I'm an attorney, and that really spoke to me as a matter of such an injustice heaped upon yes. injustice. And I, yes. I thought to myself, we could do something about that. But the reality is, you know, there were uh, legal institutions that weren't in place to protect them. We didn't no. have a bill of rights. There were so many things that are were different, even though there were so many things that were similar, like you pointed out. Yeah. So that was very hard for me to read, I have to say. Um, well, Heather, the, uh, the story of the birth of modern day Israel to me is just incredible in many levels. In fact, one of my favorite books as a teen was the book Exodus by Leon Uris. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I have been an avid reader of everything that I could get my hands on to learn. Um, but when I read that book and I read yours, I was really struck by the unflagging hope that people uh, going to Israel in its infancy, at that, the modern Israel, uh, that they espoused. I mean, they really came to an area that was, you know, there was no infrastructure. There were swamps, there were mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Right, they didn't have things in place to build a society yet. That's exactly what they set about doing. Um, and I was wondering if you thought that that determination and that hope were some of the more essential components of then being able to craft a life and a living. 
And I was also wondering if you thought that some of the environmental factors, the beauty of the land, also spurred some of that hope. Because there's such a connection to me between uh, people who live in Israel and the environment. So oh, started. absolutely. You know, absolutely. And that hope continues today with Livy and Magda that they will be able to stay living there and their hope now is for their children and great-grandchildren. But um, it's not wonderful that I've been able to tell a story about these young people who arrived in that part of the world at that pivotal point in history as that nation state was being created. And I haven't been able to tell enough in the book that I would like to write about the relationship that Levy had with the first president of Israel, Haim Wiseman, and the first first lady. Uh, that is a friendship which lasted until both Vera Wiseman and Haim Wiseman's death and their role in it. Livy, having had the first night of her marriage, having to live in a goat house, a friend they knew, kicked his goats out of the shed and that was their first home. They had never complained about the fact that they had very little to eat. It would be the same thing day after day. They had no um, infrastructure, as you say, to live under. They had to build it. They built their life. And I say really built their life, something we don't really do. Uh, a lot of it's handed to us. You know, I'm, I'm going to actually tell you something that was said to me by Livy last year, which I think might sum up where she sits in the whole coming to Israel at that time and being part of the creation of that country. In the middle of last year, when the conflict in Israel and then with the Palestinians and the Gaza Strip reared its ugly head again, and um, missiles were being rained down onto Tel Aviv, when Livy told her grandchildren to leave Tel Aviv and to go further north to get away from the shelling, because they have her great-grandchildren, Livy and Magda refused to leave their homes in Tel Aviv. They're both in their individual apartments. And I was talking to Livy's daughter and she said, we can't convince mum to leave, to come out. Magda, she, her uh, only thing she would do was when the air raid sirens go, I will go out and stand in the on the hallway of my apartment building where there's no windows. And when I said to Livy, are you sure you won't leave? Why won't you go to safety? And she said, I can't believe my Palestinian friends want to hurt me. To her, she does not. You know, I know she's not naive, don't get me wrong, but for her, that's where her head is at, um, that we have to live together. And she's been, I've been doing this, she said, now for 96 years, and I just need to make everybody around me, my family and friends, I've got to convince them we have to live together and I'm not running you know, there are so many stories um, back at the founding of the modern state of Israel of both Arabs and Jews living side by side uh, mm -hmm. in towns where they were jointly working a farm. And mm -hmm. some of those stories are incredible. And I almost think we have talked about remembering. Those are also some things maybe we should remember and focus on yes, some of are. those stories, right? Um, very powerful. Very. And um, yeah, they're the ones that are going to hopefully at some point make the possible that those two nations can live you know, in harmony. This is this is our hope. And I love what you just said about uh, her staying in the hallway and refusing to leave her home. And and I can't help but think it's because she experienced it before, forced yeah. out of her home and into war. And it, by her standing in the hallway, it was like she was standing for peace. She was saying, I'm not going to leave my home. I'm not doing this again. I'm, I'm going to stay stronger this time. And that, that's a, like a lesson to all of us. Just these three sisters yeah. uh, have, for, through your beautiful writing, have taught each of us something that we can take in our worlds, no matter what country we live in. And that's why your book is so popular all over the world. Thank you so much. I'll just, I'll just share a little thing about um, both Libby and Magda. Once again, these are things that are not in the book because they're just not part of that storyline. Um, but both those girl, women, when they were young women, they needed an outlet to be able to uh, express in some way the trauma they had, in fact, lived through. They found someone who could teach them how to paint. Now, both of those women have well over 100 works of art in their home each. 
They went to an art teacher. And when I started looking at the different things I'd been painting, I saw an absolute disconnect between the two women and what they were wanting to capture. Livy has painted nothing but nature. Trees, flowers, bushes, all hers reflect something outside. Where is Magda? She has painted homes, buildings, all kinds of structures, you know, ones with missing roofs. And that has been how these two ladies have been able to yeah, leave a little part of how they help them with the trauma through art. And they're just beautiful what they've done. Yeah, doesn't Quite that almost speak? Actually. Well, and it almost speaks to the different strengths that each of the women had in survival. You know, we draw well, it is. that, yeah. right? especially even siblings, you know, I look at my kids, I look at my siblings, we all are similar in some ways, but we're also very different. And we have these different ways of processing and interpreting information, all of which leads to a lot of beauty. And yeah. I, I think that that paint example, that's such a neat example that you gave of those different strengths yeah. expressing themselves. Yes, and I, yes, I asked the girls to, uh, to describe, just describe the differences between you as sisters. Um, I didn't have any sisters, I had four brothers. And Olivia was very, very really quick to point out. She said, well, let's put it this way. When we were at home, she said, if mama said, girls, I need someone to give me a hand, both Livy and Sibby bolted for the door and left. <laughs> and Magda was the one that would go, yes, mama, what can I do? Magda was the homebody, home for her. And to then see, and I only saw it two years ago when I was in Israel, hang on a minute, your paintings are all about homes. Yeah. That's all about who you are. Livy, you wanted to be out in the forest. And that they had, you know, they hadn't made that connection. It was obviously something that was subliminal going on with them and they were deciding to paint. Yes, and therapeutic too. And Absolutely. It's, and it's so interesting how art can take that form sometimes when you can't verbalize it. You can write a poem yeah. or paint something or uh, sculpt something. And that's a beautiful Thank story. You. So will you tell us what have do the three sisters say about the book? I would love to hear what is their reaction. <laughs> Um, brilliant. Uh, of course, Sibby died in 2014, the oldest one, so, so she doesn't even know it exists, of course. But for the other two, I have some beautiful photos of them proudly holding it uh, and just delighted that their story, now, just like Lully, they said, yes, tell our story so that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. All survivors I've met are hung up on that so it doesn't happen again. Now, sadly, we know that it has kept happening. But his fingers crossed that maybe we can make a little difference one day. Um, the families, before the book would go anywhere near a printer, my deal with them was every adult member of the family, which was three generations, their children and their adult grandchildren had to read the manuscript and approve it. Otherwise, one of them objected it would never go to the printer's. And so, yes, it's just not the two the sisters that have had to approve it, but their children and their grandchildren. Wow. Well, Heather, you are making a difference. You are creating a memory. And yes, we can't change the whole world, but you're touching the hearts of a lot of people through this story. And we are responsible for only ourselves. And I'm speaking from Kristen and me. This book touched us so very deeply. It's such a precious story. It needs to be told. We highly recommend it. And can you tell us what are you are you working on? Anything new now? What's on your radar that you're doing now? We can look forward to a little a little. We don't want to give any spoilers away, but just a little clue. There's um, a, a profession of which I've been connected to in my work from obviously decades that I think are unsung, and uh, what I'm looking at is the survival of nurses during World War II. Wow. Different theatres of war that they were in. And uh, yeah, separating them out from the conflict of the armies of which they were serving and just looking at them and, oh my goodness, uh, yes, more yeah. incredibly That's powerful. Awesome. And these are, once again, true stories which I will weave together. We, that sounds 
beautiful and we so very much look forward to it thank you so much for joining us here today and i want to tell our readers you're going to want to get this book three sisters and heather morris's other stories as well they're life-changing they're absolutely a must read and in the meantime you can connect with heather morris at heathermorrisauthor.com and you can find her on facebook thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure Thank you. talking to you. Pleasure. What a wonderful story. I just adore Heather Morris, and she is making a difference in the world with her writing. And we were enveloped into this other world that was so closely, really, to the world we're living today. And uh, I just am almost speechless over the whole thing. I just adored it. Uh, this concept of um, guilt, though, that was something that sort of stuck with me through this, that, like you said, Kristen, in your question, that we do have sometimes survivor's guilt. You know, we lose a loved one or uh, a friend or tragedy befalls someone, and we wonder, we think, how can we continue to live without this loved one? And, and we take a long time to grieve, and we may, I've lost a uh, several people in my life and you don't want to leave the house for a while and maybe you don't want to go to a social function and you don't want to talk to anyone but I think a little bit of what this story shows us is that the idea of continuing to live honors that person whose life was stolen from them and that if they could speak to us they might say yes I miss you too but you have this gift that was taken from me and go out and live it to the full. And even the characters in The Three Sisters with the, the horrific things that were done to them found the courage in their homeland of Israel to enjoy life again. They found enjoyment. Yeah, that was beautifully put, first of all, Chris. Um, you're right, because they married, they had children, uh, they pursued professions, they embraced life. And what a beautiful way to honor the sacrifice of many people. I, I agree with you. Um, I love what Heather said. She had said with survivors and survivor guilt to listen to these stories. And I just want to point out that we can still listen to these stories from people who survived the Holocaust, from people who were in other ways impacted. Many of these stories are recorded. Uh, for example, if you visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., or in Jerusalem, these stories are important and need to be listened to, even if that person's not directly in front of us. To me, it's a way of honoring them. Um, I, I think that's part and parcel, too, of remembering. I mean, think about why we remember things, so that we could honor people who experience that, so we don't repeat it, but also so that we can see patterns in our own lives that are veering towards potential evil or selfishness or racism. You know, this is how we examine our own conscience is by looking at what has occurred, remembering, and then examining and lining up our behavior with it. Yeah, I love that you said that because I, I always, and I know I said this before, I always think of this era in time as being closely related to the exact lifestyles we're living today. And I'm sure those people thought those Jews thought this could never possibly happen. And many of them were taken away thinking, okay, I'm going to a work situation or a work camp. And it was far from beyond their wildest horrific nightmare where they were being led. And, and I think, what does that mean for us today? We want to say that will never happen in the United States where we live again. But part of that responsibility falls on us. And it starts with prejudice the evil of prejudice, and I can sit here and say to you, I am not prejudiced, and I do not believe I am, but do I ever, do we ever look at people in any different way who look different from us, or act different, or wear different clothing, or have a different hair or skin color, or live in a different area of the city, and if we do, that is a form of prejudice, and I think we need to constantly check ourselves in that regard. And, and not immediately think that we're innocent, but look for ways that we can better, we're responsible for ourselves. Yeah, I love that. I always think about how can we look for things that we have in common with others? 
Um, and in fact, you know, I'm going to take this in a little direction environmentally because this is what struck out when she was talking uh, a few minutes ago. Um, we know that one of the ways that we can potentially bridge peace in very war-torn areas or where, where there's high conflict in certain areas is by focusing on what people have in common. One of the things that people groups have in common is dependence upon natural resources. So right now, for example, in the Middle East, rivers are being used as the common basis to try to bridge peace between factions and people at war with one another because they all depend upon it, they all need it, it's that common dependence that bridges the political divides. Yeah. So look at that on an individual level mm -hmm. where we can focus on what we have in common and, and look what we have in common with every people group. We love our children. We love one another, our, our spouse. We want to pursue education. We want to pursue a, profesh a profession. You know, we have goals and dreams. All people have that. I, and, I, and before we started the podcast, Kristen and I, usually spend a good amount of time discussing the book. And another thing that we touched upon was the beauty of this story when the three sisters returned to Israel, that that was their homeland, and that they cared about that, the land, and they harvested the orange groves and never complained. And, they, and it wasn't a beautiful country in many ways, as you pointed out with your research, but the treasuring of the land that we live upon is something I think we often take for granted. And as you always say, this notion of stewardship and the importance of just being grateful for a country with freedom, a piece of land that is yours. And uh, that's a great takeaway from this book as well. Yeah, I love that. All right, Chris, I'm gonna ask you what's on your radar. You asked Heather, what are you thinking about? Well, what's on my radar is pretty much what I just mentioned, that I'm gonna check my own self and I say I'm not prejudiced in any way, but do I judge someone by factors that really uh, could cause division in society? And I guess that begins with me, just begins with me, and maybe teach that to, the, to my nieces and nephews and my kids coming up behind me. Because this, this started, this Holocaust started because of hate, hate towards one specific group. And we all know, as educated society today, that every kind of group, every kind of country, nation, nationality, city, we're, we're made up of thousands of very different types of people. So that hate is illogical, it's evil, and my takeaway is let's do everything in our power to ensure it never happens again. And how about you, Kristen? Well, well first of all, I'm gonna echo that, because again, that was really well put. Uh, and I'm gonna add too, that reading this book, especially the end where there was this hope of establishing the modern state of Israel, I really enjoyed thinking about this idea of stewardship. And I'm always pressing into what does stewardship mean? It's very intentional. And the sisters in this story were intentional about how they embraced life, about how they chose to move forward, about how they chose to steward the land that was under their care. And that intentionality is something that has really stuck with me since I've read this book, in addition to numerous other important themes that we've talked about today. Such a beautiful story. I just love Heather Morris and what a wonderful writer with important novel that we should all read. So thank you for joining us on Bookstorm today. As usual, got to give a big old shout out to our incredibly talented sound engineer, the Mr. Mark Carey. And we're leaving you with a few storm predictions to pique your interest because we have a fabulous spring lineup ahead. We have Adriana Trajani with her book, The Good Left Undone. Laura Morelli and the Stolen Lady, Sandra Brown and the Blind Tiger, Fiona Davis, the Magnolia Palace, Nina de Gramont, the Christie Affair, Francine Rivers, the Lady's Mine, Teresa Ann Fowler, it all comes down to this, and Lisa Scottaline, what happened to the Bennetts. In the meantime, stay on the radar with Kristen and me Visit our website at bookstormpodcast.com. Say hi to us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And if you'd like to see us in person, or better yet, one of our wonderful authors, check out the YouTube portion of this podcast. 
Until next time, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction. Thank you.